Hello. Um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit, well, it's just a few thoughts really about the um, situation with Shamima Begum um, in the UK and her lawyer's um, attempts to get her to return to the UK so that she can fight for her, to have her British citizenship um, reinstalled. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not a lawyer. Um, don't pretend to be. Uh, <laughs> I'm just um, an expat um, British British citizen who currently lives in Colombia. And I've been following this story for a while. And there's a few things about it that I find quite disturbing. Um, well, <laughs> more than a few things. I mean, obviously, it's a really disturbing situation. Um, for those of you who are watching this, if you're still watching this and you don't really know what I'm talking about, uh, Shamina Begum was, is a woman who left the UK, I think when she was 15 years old, um, to join Islamic State um, with a couple of her, her school friends. And at the time, um, she disappeared from, I think, the sort of Bethnal Green area of London, East London, Central East London. And there was like a big hunt for her. Nobody knew where she was. And then they found some CCTV cameras uh, that had filmed her and her friends leaving the country, uh, I think, via Turkey, um, sort of, you know, at the dead of night kind of thing. Um, and then nobody knew what happened to them. And then it was only... I think several years later when some journalists were at one of the refugee camps in Syria for um, the wives, sort of displaced, could I use the word displaced, displaced wives of former ISIS fighters or current ISIS fighters, that they found her, um, I'm not sure whether she had two children with her at the time or one child, um, and they found her living in very, very precarious circumstances in one of these refugee camps and interviewed her and then got in touch with her family to let them know that she was, you know, safe, as it were. I'm not sure you could say anything more than that, you know, kind of she was located, perhaps it's better to say. Um, and since then, uh, her, her lawyer, um, and I'm not sure if that's representing the family or representing her, um, has been trying to get the British government to reinstate her citizenship, which they stripped of Shamima. Um, and they argued, in fact, that uh, sort of through her family lineage, she should be entitled to Bangladeshi citizenship. I think even though she's, I don't even know if she's ever been to Bangladesh, but you know, her, her family have um, come from, from, Bangladesh, uh, you know, either in this generation or the previous generation, so she's got Bangladeshi heritage, as it were. Um, so what do I think about this? I mean, the first question I ask myself is, why do I take an interest particularly in this story, particularly as a British expatriate that doesn't currently live in England, although, you know, who knows whether I'll, I might end up back in England. But, um, why am I following this story? And and the truth of it is, is that when I left England in 2013, my generation, and I don't mean people in their 20s and 30s, I mean, I'm in my, I'm in my mid 30s. Um, people of my generation, we have lived through um, serious, <coughs> sorry, I've got a cough at the moment, serious, um, consequences of Islamic terrorism in the United Kingdom. Um, bombings to the London transport system, um, other bombings in other parts of the country, um, stabbings on bridges, uh, you know, all horrendous, just horrendous events that have caused the deaths of so many people and disruption to the lives of all of us. Um, I mean, the I think even more recently in, the, in Manchester, there was a horrendous explosion at a concert of, of young people that were attending a concert. I mean, it's just, it's just unfathomable. And so what I find particularly disturbing about the Shamima case is 
for those of you who are familiar with it and have watched maybe the videos where she's been interviewed in Syria, uh, talking about her experiences and why she, she kind of would like to come back to the UK. Um, I mean, I'm not really working that much as a psychologist anymore, but, you know, perhaps it's the psychologist in me, but when I see Shamima talking, I feel like I'm looking at a person that's extremely disturbed. And in the media, there's a huge emphasis on kind of saying, well, you know, one argument for possibly letting Shamima come back to the UK um, is that, you know, she was only 15 when she left. You know, she was kind of a minor and, you know, she can't possibly have known what she was getting involved in. Uh, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't find that a compelling argument at all. In fact, I believe that even legally, she she was past the age of criminal responsibility when she left the UK as a 15 year old. But that aside, I mean, not, I mean, you know, I'm not, obviously I'm not 15 anymore, but I was once. I mean, what 15 year old woman thinks that rape and beheading and uh, bombing and, um, you know, <laughs> that kind of violence, you know, I mean, and, you know, I mentioned rape at the beginning, and I think that's because we know what Islamic State's policy was towards Yazidi women, particularly young women. Um, you know, they were literally kidnapped um, and sold into sexual slavery, quite often passed around from, you know, one elderly man to the next, not that the age of the man is important, but, you know, it's just... The whole thing is so disturbing, and we've we've all seen the testimonies of those women who are, you know, the survivors that are trying to rebuild their lives, whose whose innocence and you know has been totally destroyed. It's just been totally destroyed and, and abused, and it's just unforgivable. It's absolutely unforgivable. I think what what has been done to the Yazidi people. Um, and, and at the time when Shamima left, she knew that that was happening. I mean, she knew what she was joining. I mean, it wasn't like she thought she was joining um, a kind of picnic club or something. <laughs> you know, a, everybody knew what Islamic State stood for. And in fact, in the interviews with Shamima, um, she isn't disturbed by this at all. I mean, when journalists say to her, you know, what did you think about the beheadings and the, you know, heads in, in dustbins and, and violence and all this kind of, you know, she sort of says, well, she actually says, you know, well, I was okay with it because um, I had become religious. I mean, she, she, she thinks that, you know, these values are what it is to be religious. Um, I was religious and I, you know, this is what I wanted to live under Islamic law and this is what Islamic law says is okay. So I was okay with it. Um, and then the journalists sort of say, well, you know, at what point did it get very bad for you in Syria? You know, and she says, oh, no, you know, it was kind of, it was great. The whole time it was fantastic. You know, it was just like the, the propaganda videos, you know, you could have a family. And, you know, it only got bad at the end when, you know, basically my children were starving. Um, so it's, it's like she doesn't, she doesn't seem to show any remorse or change of opinion about what's happened. You know, it's not like she's saying, oh my God, you know, I found out what was happening to the Yazidi women and I realized that, you know, I'd made a terrible mistake or I realized that, you know, Islamic State were actually not very nice, not a very nice organization, you know. There's absolutely no sense that she has any kind of change of uh, opinion. <laughs> And I find that incredibly disturbing. And and again, as, as a kind of, maybe as a psychologist, although I would just say as a human being, when I look at Shamima talking, I find her body language to be really peculiar. I mean, it, you know, it's like there's nothing behind the eyes. I mean, she almost looks like she can't be bothered to, to talk to the journalists. And I mean, I do try to imagine what it must be like to be living in a refugee camp in Syria at the moment with, you know, I think she's now lost all three of her children through illness and malnutrition. Um, so I, mean, I can't begin to imagine the things she's seen and what she's lived through and, and, you know, the losses and everything else. But at the same time, it's like that doesn't seem to have made her think, mm, 
you know, maybe Islamic State are terrible people, you know, it's like, it doesn't seem, it's more like just, you know, I'm tired, you know, I can't really be bothered to talk to you. Um, and then she sort of says, oddly, you know, I'm kind of hoping that the British people might have some sympathy for my situation. I'm like, and this is when she really loses me. It's like, um, what sympathy do you have, Shamima, for uh, people that have lost their partners, their children, um, you know, that have been disfigured, that have, I mean, you know, that's just not, I mean, it's just unimaginable, the consequences in the UK of the Islamic ter um, terrorism, let alone, or Islamist terrorism, I believe is the, the, the correct term, um, let alone in other parts of the world, like Syria, you know, they've just, been, you know, literally destroyed to smithereens. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, I don't know, I just, I just find it incredible. And you, you, I think that the British people, as it were, that, that say they don't really want her back, um, I think they have a legitimate reason to be very concerned about having someone like that back, who doesn't seem to show any remorse for her actions. So if, if it was the case that, you know, what do you do with a person like that if she comes back to the UK? Does she, does she go into some kind of psychiatric hospital? Uh, does she go to prison for life? Um, is she allowed back out onto the streets with a different identity? I mean, to, to what? To do what? I mean, is she going to be some kind of political threat moving forward to the United Kingdom, um, particularly if her ideology doesn't seem to have changed? Um, you know, so I, I just, I don't really know what the solution is to this problem. Because I, I don't find the Bangladeshi sort of, you know, let's just send her to Bangladesh. I don't find that very compelling either, because, I mean, obviously she's not Bangladeshi. I mean, just because, you know, her grandparents are Bangladeshi or something. You know, it's, you know, it's like, like, I don't know, sending me back to, I don't know, um, Denmark or something, because, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, <laughs> Um, I have some kind of Nordic ancestry or something. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you can't just sort of palm off somebody and you don't like the way they've behaved and say, oh, oh, but the good thing is, you know, she's got a grandparent from, from Bangladesh. I don't find that compelling. So I don't think that's um, a solution. So I don't really know what the solution is. I think this issue of sort of being a traitor to your country is a very complicated issue. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know... <laughs> what is done about that in legal terms. But I think there might, you know, one has to consider that there are some crimes that one can commit against one's own people that are so, so serious that it might mean that they cannot really be rehabilitated. Um, that as to what should happen to, I, I really don't know, but I, but I, I would be concerned. I am concerned about Shamima and possibly other Shamimas, you know, because obviously she's not the only uh, young woman um, or chap, you know, that joined that joined Islamic State. Um, that you know, it's kind of it's all you know gone to the shit, shall we say? And and now it's like, oh well, maybe now I'll go back to my life in London or my life in England. And I don't know. It's, it's a really serious issue, and but I I think I can understand why people are so concerned about it. Um, because we've lived through such hell with it, and it hasn't really finished. I mean, even a few weeks ago, I, you know, my my what my best friend lives in in Vienna, and um, with his wife and child, and there was you know a horrendous attack in Vienna. Um, you know, messaging each other, Are "You okay? Are you safe?" You know, didn't get back to me immediately, um, <coughs> and. Um, you know, it's like, <coughs> sorry, I've still got this awful cough. <coughs> we won't say what's causing that. Um, was really concerned about him and, you know, eventually gets back and says, yeah, unfortunately there was there was a terrorist attack, really awful, you know. And this, this problem is still going on. So it's like, what, do we allow these people to sort of regroup all across Europe and make these attacks more frequent again, which people like me were experiencing, you know, I have to say, it was one of the reasons I left um, the UK. I have to be quite honest with you. I, mean, it's, I got really sick of it. I got really sick of the um, kind of the apologising, honestly, by by parts of the media um, for this problem. 
um, like this, you know, I, th I think what tolerance can be taken too far. You know, it's it's one thing to tolerate somebody's religious beliefs when they don't impinge upon your own uh, right to sort of walk down the street safely or not. But it's quite another thing to tolerate somebody's so-called religious beliefs when they're using them to justify blowing up the London Underground and you're just trying to get to work and get home safely. Um, I don't think that's something anybody should have to tolerate. Um, you know, terrorism is terrorism. You know, the, the religious motivation or, or whatever the motivation is for the terrorist act, quite frankly, is irrelevant. Um, you know, a crime is a crime, you know, whether you do, you're doing it because you say God told you to do it or whether you're doing it uh, for some other reason. It, I mean, I don't see why it should really make a difference. But my feeling seeing people like Shamima talk in these interviews, I'll link one of the interviews below so you can see, is they just look honestly like they're not very mentally well. I mean, I, I don't believe that she entered this kind of group because she was... 15 and naive and that you know sort of had crappy parenting or something I, I, I think that you know pro probably there's something very seriously wrong with a person that thinks that beheading somebody wherever they're from in the world is um, you know legitimate <laughs> or deserved um, so yeah I don't know I, I guess I, I don't really I mean do I have a strong view on this I, I, I don't you know, I wouldn't like Shamima to come back to the UK, that's the truth of it. But similarly, I don't know what the law should do with her. Um, Siri seems to want to speak. I don't know how to turn her off. I don't know whether she's got an opinion or not. Um, but I'd be interested to know to know your views. Um, I mean, I mean, another argument is that, you know, oh, well, we can't sort of say we believe in human rights and stuff if we don't apply that to everybody. Mm, you know, Shamima deserves her human rights as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I do believe that, but I but I also think that, you know, sometimes you you might do something so serious that the consequences are unavoidable, and I'm not sure that the British state can literally afford the risk of having somebody like her um, living back with, within its borders. So um, I don't know. Tell me what you think. I mean, I, I guess. I'm still not 100% sure myself what should be done, but it's, but it's topical anyway. Okay, thank you for listening. Bye.